hope you were enjoying going through Luke as much as I am. I, I enjoy the time that I spend in study every week as we look at what God has said. I mentioned to you, this is my favorite book in the New Testament, is the Gospel of Luke. I think one of the reasons that I like it is the, the amount of detail. Obviously, Luke was a doctor, and so a man who cared about the little, little details and the little uh, nitpicky things, and he includes a lot of that in his, in his gospel, and I, I just love the, the level of detail that he gives. Last week, we looked at Jesus' dealings with the Pharisees regarding their man-made rules for the Sabbath. And if you remember, we actually talked through some of the crazy rules they have for the Sabbath. They, they wouldn't allow you to carry anything that weighed more than a dried fig. Dragging a chair across the floor was considered an act of plowing. It was just a, it was a mess. And it was to this that Jesus uh, came and he defended the actions of his disciples. You remember, they were walking through a field of grain on the Sabbath. And they, they put their hands down and they, they popped the heads off of some of the very lightly wheat. And, uh, and then they would rub them in their hands and blow the chaff away, and then they could eat. And it was permitted by the law. It was, it was okay to do. But the, the religious leaders of that day, they saw the disciples doing that, and they said, Well, you're, you're engaging in a harvesting operation with your fingers. And those of, those of us who live here, we know the, uh, the futility of trying to harvest a field with your fingers. But uh, nonetheless, that's what the, these religious leaders said. They said, And when you do this, well, you're threshing. <laughs> and, and Jesus said in that that he was Lord of the Sabbath as well. And he, he kind of embarrassed them a little bit, graciously, but he shared with them a story from their history. As you remember from Sunday school, even this morning, he shared with them the story of David when he went to Nob and ate the showbread out of the tabernacle. Something that wasn't permitted by the law, but and they, they were not willing to condemn King David. They were too proud of King David, so they ended up looking kind of foolish. And then another Sabbath, he healed a man with a withered hand who was in the synagogue. And you remember, they were, they were all concerned that Jesus is going to do an act of labor. And Jesus didn't do an act of labor. You remember, he said, stretch forth your hand. And the man stretched forth his hand, and it was made whole. And so no act of labor. But the way in which Christ dealt with these attacks drove the Pharisees into an angry frenzy. If you look at verse 11, it says that they were filled with madness. That means they, they went out of their heads just a little bit. So they, they got to the point where they weren't making any sense. They went away defeated to plot their next line of attack. We've been tracking the Galilean of min ministry of Christ over the past few weeks, and we've seen him almost constantly surrounded by crowds. Everywhere he goes, a crowd follows. People want to see the greatest celebrity of their day, and Jesus would have been there. The fame of Jesus went through Judea, Samaria, Galilee, would have gone into Syria. Would have, it went everywhere. They knew about Jesus all over the place. They had a lot of, of, of truths that they knew about him. And they, they, you can also imagine for every truth that they knew about Jesus, they likely knew a half dozen untruths or exaggerated uh, accounts of what he had done. There are times in Christ's ministry where his days overlapped. He ministered starting on one day and, and just went through the night all the way into the next day. And as we've also seen the attacks on Christ and his ministry from the religious elite of his day are intensifying. So the pressure is starting to build on the Lord Jesus Christ. He is surrounded by crowds. We saw that um, the, the religious leaders were lurking. The reason why they were in the field at all is because they were hiding there looking for Jesus. Okay, so, so Jesus, the pressure on Jesus' ministry is mounting as, as he's busy 24-7 sometimes. And as he has very little time uh, to do anything other than ministry. And it's in the midst of these events that we see Christ make some important decisions regarding his closest followers. But first... In verse 12, we read, And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. It came to pass in those days. What days? Well, the days we just described. Non-stop ministry. Crowds all the time. 
growing crowds. You remember every time Jesus healed someone and they went and said, Jesus just healed me of leprosy. Or Jesus just made me see and I haven't been able to see it my whole life. And so every person who told someone else would add to the crowd. And so Jesus' crowd just keeps expanding. There's the lurking religious leaders, their frequent personal attack. The ministry of Christ had been going at this point for approximately one year. You'd say there's no way that what we've read has taken one year. And you're right. Jesus spent approximately one year in the region of Judea following his baptism and then his time of temptation in the wilderness. He returned and he was there in the, the southern region, what would be around the area of Jerusalem and, and uh, the, the Dead Sea in that area. is where Jesus was for about one year. And he has about two years left. Jesus' public ministry here on earth was three, three and a half years, depending. We don't know which mountain he's by. It says that he went out into a mountain to pray. Because we don't know exactly where he's ministering. There are lots of mountains around the Sea of Galilee. It's kind of in a basin. Uh, that's what leads to the, the tumultuous weather on the Sea of Galilee. That's why the storms that we read of could come up so quickly. Because the, the weather would come down out of the mountains, descend into the basin that is the Sea of Galilee, and, and you would have these storms. And so into one of these mountains, very likely, here in the region of Galilee, Jesus goes for the purpose of spending a night in prayer. It says that he continued all night. It's one Greek word, and it means to sit up the whole night. Maybe you've referred to it this way. Have you ever said, I pulled an all-nighter? That's the one, it's kind of a hyphenated word, an all-nighter. Jesus pulls an all-nighter. He spends the entire night in prayer to God the Father. Now, why would Jesus take this much time in prayer? I'm going to ask you a question. Who is Jesus? Son of God. He is God in the flesh, right? He's, he's, the, third, he's the second part of the Trinity. He's, he's God in the flesh. Well, Jesus spends time with God because he knows of the important decision that he's getting ready to make. The very next morning, he's going to make a decision that will very much shape the next two years of his public ministry. If you looked ahead, you'll see that Jesus is going to choose his 12 apostles. He's going, to, he's going to narrow down, and we'll deal with that in just a moment. But in light of the momentous choice ahead, Christ spends the entire night in prayer to God, according to our text. Again, in prayer to God is a unique Greek construction, and it could also be, it could also be translated in the prayer of God. Me meaning what? Meaning that the Trinity is fellowshipping together. You have God the Son praying to God the Father with the, the presence of the Holy Spirit who was upon Christ. So you have the Trinity all, all fellowshipping together in conversation. They're, they're, they're having a conversation amongst the persons of the Godhead when he says that he spent time in prayer to God. All three persons are present because of the, the momentous decision that's about to be made. And we would be amiss to not grab the easy application of this verse. If Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, took time, even if it meant it was while others were sleeping, for communion with God in prayer, then what's your excuse? And what's my excuse? He's, he is God. So, so he knows the mind of God, correct? He knows all things. Jesus is omniscient. He knows all things. That's why as we've gone, even through the six chapters that we've gone through in the Gospel of Luke, we've read several times, and Jesus knew their thoughts. How did Jesus know their thoughts? Because Jesus knew everything. He knew their family history. He knew the things they hadn't told anyone else. Jesus knows all things. And so Jesus, who knows all things, Jesus, who is God, in the flesh, took time. He took inconvenient time to pray through the midst of the night. Jesus placed a priority on time with God. Jesus, Jesus cared deeply about spending that sweet hour of prayer. The same trinity that was present in the prayer of Christ in this passage 
is also present when you and I bow our heads and go into the throne room of grace. That same Jesus, that same Father, we pray this morning, if you've prayed this morning, and I hope you have, if you pray this morning, you pray to the Father through the Son. That's why we say in Jesus' name. That's how we get into the presence of God because of, of the, the sacrifice of Jesus. We pray to the Father through the Son with the help of the Holy Spirit, who according to Romans 8.26, make an intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. The psalm that Bev just sang, that, that tears are a language that God understands. The reason why is because when we go before the Lord God in prayer, we bow our heads and the tears begin to flow and we don't even have words for what we need. We have the Holy Spirit who goes before, who goes before the presence of the Father and says, this is what they want. This is what they need. He makes, he makes my nonsense make sense. To the Lord, to, to God the Father, because of the sacrifice of God the Son, Jesus Christ. To honestly spend an hour in prayer before the throne is difficult, isn't it? It, it is for me. I'll tell you what, to pray is honestly about the hardest thing I do in a day. I don't struggle to read my Bible because the Bible is a, it's a living book. And you spend some time in God's Word. And it's not difficult. No, I will be honest again, as I have been in the past, there are some difficult passages. There are some passages where you, you think, my goodness, I don't know what this is saying. So you, so you spend more time and you dive a little bit deeper. And, and all of Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness. So all Scripture is for our good. But then it comes time to pray. You spend your time in God's Word and then you bow your head and you think about lunch. Or you think about what you have to do tonight or what you have to do tomorrow. Or you think about when the kids are going to drop by. Or you think about any number of things. As soon as you bow, I, I'll admit, the hardest thing I do in a day is spend good, quality, unbroken time with God in prayer. Because I, I'm busy. I know you're busy. And, and as soon as we bow our heads, there are some times where it's just hard to pray. You think, I've got so many. I, I really just don't have time. And when you're in the midst of that situation, you need to remember that Jesus spent all night and he's God. He, he knows because he knows everything. But he spent time in prayer. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, spent time in prayer as an example to us. You're going to spend 15 minutes in prayer. It's a, it's a good benchmark to aim at. If you'd say, you know, I struggle with prayer. Sometimes I, I just pray for meals. Sometimes I forget to do that. If, if you're looking for a benchmark, say, I'm going to spend 15 minutes with the Lord today. But you'll need to set aside more than 15 minutes. Because as soon as you bow your head, your, your mind's going to wander. And you say, nope, come back here. You say, Lord, sorry. Back. Where were we? And your mind goes running off in another direction. And through, through a process, through habitual work, you get to the point where you can bow your head and you feel like you walk right into the throne room of God. Distractions still come, but you've dealt with them. It's, it's, it's like a muscle. By, by use, you develop it. Well, prayer is the same way. You spend time in prayer. If Jesus needed to do it, then I need to do it and you need to do it for sure be easy for us to allow prayer to take a back seat in our schedules. Don't do it. Jesus himself spent the whole night. Do you think Jesus was tired this night? Of course. I think Jesus was tired for the entire three years of his ministry. You remember on one occasion he fell asleep in the back of a boat that was going through a storm. You don't do that unless you're really, really tired, but Jesus did. The reason why? Because he was constantly busy. He was constantly about his father's business, but he understood that prayer is part of his father's business. Now we come to verse 13, and we see a process of elimination is going to take place. Jesus' night in prayer was no ordinary time of prayer. He was praying for the events that immediately follow. Verse 13, And when it was day, he called his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, whom also he named apostles. This is a truth that can help you as you go through Scripture, as you just go through in your regular study. 
Jesus had lots of disciples. He had thousands of disciples. Okay? A disciple simply means a pupil or a learner or a follower, you could say. If, if you were to say, I'm going to teach someone a discipleship course, I'm going to teach them to follow God. That's part of the discipleship. And so you have Jesus Christ. He's the center of this, this circle here. And then you have the disciples, those who follow him. Those who, who just came and they, they came from, you know, their home in Bethsaida. They came and they wanted to hear this Jesus that they've been hearing about. They would be a disciple. They were someone who came to learn. The religious leaders would not be disciples. Okay? They, were, they may have been in the area, but they had no intent of learning. But there were thousands, perhaps millions of, loosely speaking, Disciples. Again, Josephus said that the population of this area was approximately 6 million in the days of Christ. So Jesus would have had a tremendously large following, and yet we have all of these disciples. And so from his disciples, from the mass of people following him, Jesus is going to choose 12 apostles. All apostles are disciples. But not all disciples are apostles. And that will help you as you go through your reading of Scripture. Jesus had lots of disciples. We talk, and, and I may even in this message slip up and say the 12 disciples. When we talk about the 12, we're talking about the apostles. They're the, the, uh, the, the, the much narrower application of the word, though. Some of Christ's disciples have already been following him. You remember Peter. And Andrew, and James, and John. We already read of their calling. Jesus said, follow me. And they left their father's nets, their boats, their business, and they followed Christ. You remember, we made a little bit bigger of a deal about it when we looked at the call of Levi, the publican. Jesus went to him and he said, follow me. It's an aorist tense, an aorist imperative, meaning start following me and don't stop. So Jesus would tell Jesus would have likely, as a child, have told his brothers and sisters at times, follow me. We're, we're going in for dinner. <laughs> follow me. But they're, they're not apostles of, of Christ. No, this is a, a specific calling to full-time following or, or a more intense discipleship here in this passage. Christ is going to round out his circle of intimate followers with twelve. Twelve total. What is an apostle? It says, whom he also named apostles. The last phrase of verse 13. The word apostle, apostolos, is a delegate, an ambassador of the gospel, a commissioner of Christ. He that is sent is an apostle, someone who goes in the name of another. We could... In using this, we won't, but we could call the American ambassador to England, we could call him the American apostle, okay? And we would be radically misunderstood if we did so because of the culture that we live in, but it's the same principle. That's what it means at its base. An apostle is one who is sent with the full authority of the one who sent him. Jesus is going to send forth the disciples at the end of his ministry here on earth, before he ascends, he gives the great commission where he says, Go therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them. Okay, That's what Jesus is going to do. That's the purpose for the disciples. And Jesus is selecting these 12 men who will become the recipients of his specialized attention and mentoring over the course of the next two years. I paid money to go to Bible college. You cannot put a price on two years with Jesus. Could you imagine to get to walk with him, to get a front row seat at all of the miracles, to get to participate in some of the miracles, to, to be right there. When you have a question and you think, my, I don't know what this means. You say, what does this mean? What a time, what a privilege that these 12 men had to be with Jesus. Now, obviously, we have the Holy Spirit of God indwelling us if we've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. So we do have something that at this point they didn't even have. But the, the benefit of two years' intense discipleship 
with Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, to get to be there at all of his sermons, to get to hear what he sang. Can't put a price on it. And in just a moment, we're going to go over the list, and we're going to see what Scripture tells us about these special men. But in 2020, and in all times recent, occasionally we hear of men, and occasionally women, claiming to be apostles. Is this valid? Well, no, and I'll make the case to you here in just a second. Apostles are chosen by Christ for a reason. They were specifically chosen, as you'll see in the verses to come. One of their reasons, one of the reasons why the apostles were chosen is because of Ephesians chapter 2, where we read, starting in verse 19, you have verse 20 in front of you, but let me read the verse before. It says, Now therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. One of the reasons for the office of the apostle was the foundation of the church. The message of the apostles was the message on which the church was built. Jesus said to Peter, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. He doesn't mean Peter. If he meant Peter, then the church failed. Okay? Very early on, because remember, Peter denied Christ three times. Okay, So we're not talking about Peter. What we're talking about is the truth that Peter had just confessed. Right before Jesus said, upon this rock I'll build my church, Peter had said, thou art the Christ. So that's the rock on which the church is built. That's, that's one of the teachings of the, of the apostles. That's one of the purposes for the apostles. Another purpose for the apostles, one of their reasons for existing was to be the recipient of special information. The apostle Paul was an apostle. He spends a lot of time defending his apostleship. In Ephesians 3, verse 3, he says, How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore a few words, whereby when ye read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Verse 5 says, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Number one, apostles exist for the foundation, they're teaching for the foundation of the church. Number two, apostles exist because they were a recipient of special information. A lot of apostles wrote scripture. John, Peter, Matthew, Paul, all of these men wrote scripture. They were given special revelation. They were given... God said to them, this is what I mean, write it down. This is what I'm saying, write it down. That's what God did. So that's their second reason for the existence of the apostles. Number three, for the edification of the body of Christ, the church. Ephesians 4.11 says, and he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. And then he says why. In verse 12 he says, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. One reason for the apostles, another, the third that we've listed here, is for the edification of the body of Christ, especially in those early years as they, as they faced such tumultuous times. Fourth reason, the last one that we'll give here this morning, the apostles existed for the working of miracles to confirm the message of Christ. 2 Corinthians 12.12 12 says, Truly the signs of an apostle, an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. What is the purpose for a miracle? There's a purpose. It's to bring glory to God. Which is one way that you can very easily see through some of the miracle working ministries that broadcast today. Because the miracles bring glory to the person who's performing them. Okay? When, when, if I could say to you, I'm going to perform a miracle. You'd do well to watch, but you know what you'd watch? You'd watch me fail because I can't perform miracles. Because that's not the way that God is dealing. Am I saying that God doesn't work miracles in 2020? No. Absolutely not. There, there are lots of miracles. I've got three little miracles. Those are the first, first ones that I can think of. I was there in the delivery room as I watched the miracle of, of birth. You can't tell me that God doesn't perform miracles, but obviously we're talking about a different sort here, aren't we? 
We're talking about raising from the dead. We're talking about, uh, about the healing of the blind. Not again, not again to say that there has never been someone who has prayed that God would restore their sight, and he has. But that's what we're saying here. The reason for the apostles being able to work a miracle is this. Let me, let me give you a little bit of a, of a scenario here. You have two fishermen. Let's say it's Peter and John because they seem to have kind of a friendly rivalry going on. Peter and John walk into a synagogue in a little known town in Judea. And they walk in and they start preaching about this Jesus of Nazareth. And everybody knows who Jesus is. They remember he was, he was crucified. They say he rose from the dead. And then they, they say he rose back up into heaven. And, and Peter and John are standing there and they're saying, Jesus wasn't just a good man or a moral teacher. He's the Messiah that we've been waiting for. And he's come. If you'll place your faith in Christ alone, he'll save you. And you have all of these people in the synagogue and they say, why should we believe you? You're a fisherman from Galilee. I have no reason to believe you here in the synagogue. And Peter and John say, here's, here's one reason why you should. Because, and he turns to a man who's been blind from birth, and he says, in the name of Jesus Christ, see. And the man opens his eyes. That would lend an awful lot of credence to their message, wouldn't it? That's the purpose for the miracles that were wrought in this day. That's one of the reasons that the apostles existed. The apostle Paul, we read in Acts that there were people who would line the streets and they would lay their sick relatives out so that Paul's shadow would touch them. Why? So that Paul could be a superstar? No, so that people would believe in the apostle Paul's God. That's the purpose for the apostles. And with these four purposes in mind, Scripture gives no indication that the office of apostle was to continue after the death of the original calling by Christ. One of the prerequisites that are laid out in the, in the book of Acts for being an apostle was to be an eyewitness to the resurrected Christ. And since Christ isn't revealing himself in physical form in this day and age, it would preclude the existence of any more apostles. So when you hear of so-and-so demanding that they be referred to as apostle so-and-so, you should question. It might not be that they're ill, they're Ill will. They may be someone who just doesn't know. But the, the office of the apostle has passed. It, has, it has, has other offices. He mentions even there... In uh, Ephesians 4.11, and he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. So there are still people who are here to, to teach the church. But let's talk about the twelve. Let's get specific with the twelve. Verse 14. Simon, so he's calling the twelve here. Simon, whom he also called Peter. And Andrew, his brother. James and John. Philip, Bartholomew. Matthew, Thomas. James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, called Zelotes, Judas, the brother of James, and Judas Iscariot, which also was the traitor. Christ chose a cross-section of society to make up his inner circle. That's of note. Christ didn't choose uh, the religious elite, which again, as we mentioned last week, would have been kind of a slap in the face to them. They would have thought, well, of course Jesus is going to choose some Pharisees, but he, he didn't. One day in the future, we'll look in depth at all 12 apostles. We'll spend as many weeks as it takes, and we'll look at all of them. But as we merely introduce them by name here in Luke 6, we're going to deal with them in overview this morning. Otherwise, we would be here, and we would overlap our days, so we're not going to do that. Let's start off with Simon. Simon, whom he also named Peter. In each of the listings of the apostles, when you read in the Gospels, every time you see a listing of the apostles... Guess whose name is first? Peter. I was reading the other day, and someone said that Peter was a disciple with a foot-shaped mouth. The reason why? Because he spent a lot of time with his foot in his mouth. Peter very regularly engaged his mouth before he engaged his brain. That's why he ended up saying things like, Not so, Lord. That doesn't work. If he's God, if he's Lord, you don't say no to him. But that's what happened. Peter was a man of extremes. He was extremely passionate about Christ, and he was extreme in his denial of Christ that same night, if you remember. The Bible says that he denied him with a curse. 
Okay, so he was a man of extremes. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 2, we read, The first, Simon, who is also called Peter, this is another list of the disciples. The word first is the word protos. What you think prototype. He was the first. He was, he was the leader. Peter was the leader of the disciples. Also, the most outspoken. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 17, we read that Simon, his full name was Simon Barjona. Jonas, meaning Simon, the son of Jonas, or John. Jesus gave Simon a second name, and that's how we usually refer to him. We usually call him Simon Peter, or just Peter. Peter means Petros, or a rock, or a stone, and Peter had already played an important part in the ministry of Christ. He's only going to rise in prominence in the chapters to come. Peter has done much. And he will do much. Peter takes a front seat through uh, the Gospels. He also takes a front seat in the book of Acts as well. He and Paul are, are kind of the, the two uh, protagonists of the book of Acts. Peter would be the author of two books in the New Testament. Can you guess which ones? First and Second Peter. First and Second Peter. Go. Those are the books that were written by the Apostle Peter. Next, we have Andrew. Andrew is his brother. And that is how he is referred to most regularly, his brother, or Peter's brother. Could you imagine growing up in the shadow of your sibling? Perhaps you'd say, know what it's like? I lived it, right? And I have an older brother, so I know what it's like, at least to be in some circles referred to as, you're Wes's brother, right? My brother is incredibly musical. And so when we were in school together, he went through high school. He's four years older than me, so he went through ahead of me. And I had a teacher one time look at me. She said, I can't believe you're Wes's brother. <laughs> and she meant it exactly how you're hearing it, too. And it, I'd say it hurt my feelings, but it really didn't. <laughs> I was okay with it. But that's how Andrew's referred to. He's Andrew. Well, he's, oh, you know Andrew. He's, he's Peter's brother. And that's how he is referred to all throughout Scripture. Andrew, the word Andreas, means manly. Andrew was a man who lived in the shadow of his outspoken older brother his whole life. Andrew did not seem to mind being a man who worked in the background because every time, in the three major instances in which his actions are described for us, in John 1, in John 6, and in John 12, every time you see Andrew where it goes into detail, he's bringing somebody to Jesus. He's, he's taking them by the hand or putting his arm around their shoulder and says, let's, let's go see Jesus about this. Or let me introduce you to Jesus of Nazareth. Let me tell you about Jesus. That's what Andrew does all throughout Scripture. James, another famous brother duo among the disciples. James and John, the next disciple that we'll look at, were the sons of Zebedee. They were fishermen. They worked alongside Peter and Andrew on the Sea of Galilee. That's how they earned their living. Because of their forceful personalities, James and John were referred to by Jesus as the sons of thunder. And he didn't mean it entirely as a compliment. He, again, these were two young men of tremendous passion. And they, they went into things. In one instance, in Luke 9, James and John got caught up in a moment as Jesus was insulted by a Samaritan village. And they said, Lord, should we call down fire on them? Is that what Jesus is all about? How many times did Jesus call down fire on a village? None. But these two boys, man, they were, on, they were hot under the collar. They insulted Jesus. Lord, we'll get it. We got this. They didn't have it, right? But they got caught up in the moment. As, as men are prone to do at times. James was a man of passion along with his brother John. John is referred to in the gospel that he wrote as the disciple whom Jesus loved. He rarely refers to himself as John or I or in a first person pronoun. John was the disciple who leaned on the breast of Christ at the Last Supper. He was the one, and we'll deal with it. There was a lot of interaction between John and Peter. The other half of the sons of thunder. In Mark 10, 37, James and John were both rebuked by Christ for their desire to be second in command in the kingdom. You remember? They, they came to Christ, and they were having a conversation amongst themselves. Again, 
they were disciples or apostles of Jesus who knows thoughts. And they're having a conversation behind his back about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And then James and John got their mother involved in it as well. And their mother went to Jesus and said, would you give my sons the, the, you know, the, the second in command position in the kingdom? And Jesus rebuked them. That's where we get the song, Are Ye Able? Is, is loosely based on that passage. John wrote five books of the New Testament. He wrote the Gospel of John, he wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and he wrote Revelation. John is also called the Revelator. Peter, James, and John made up the inner circle of the apostles. So you have disciples, anyone who follows Jesus, for almost any reason. You have the apostles, the, the, the chosen few, those who were real close to Christ for the, the two, two and a half years that they were with him. And then within the apostles, you have these, these three. Peter, James, and John were the inner circle. They got invited into places that the other disciples didn't. On the night when Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, he asked these three to go a little bit further in with him. So they were a little bit closer to Christ even than the rest of the apostles. Philip. You know what Philip means? It's a deeply spiritual meaning. Means lover of horses. It's not a, not a very spiritual meaning. John 144 tells us that Philip was a native of Bethsaida, so he lived on the Sea of Galilee. He was called by Christ to follow him in John 143, and his first act was to go and tell Nathaniel. He's the one who went and found Nathaniel under a tree, and he said, We found him. We found the Messiah. This Philip is not the same Philip that's mentioned. In Acts 8, he's not the Philip who got up into the chariot with the Ethiopian eunuch. That's Philip the evangelist. This is Philip the apostle. Two different men, both with the same passion in life, but different men altogether. You'll note, as we go down this list, we have less and less information about these men. Next, we have Bartholomew. Bartholomew, the, you hear the word bar, meaning son of. Bartholomew is the son of Tolmai, is what that name means virtually means. It's thought by many that Bartholomew is another name for Nathaniel. Perhaps this is the Nathaniel who Philip went and told. Many believe that the two ran together. If this is the case, Bartholomew was again introduced to Christ by Philip. Matthew. We know a little bit about Matthew. Matthew uh, means gift of Jehovah. Matthew is another name for, you remember? Levi, the publican. That's this man, Levi. Matthew was a tax collector in Galilee who was called by Jesus in Luke 5. The last chapter we dealt with his calling. Matthew is the penman of the gospel of Matthew. Thomas. Thomas, also called Didymus, according to Matthew, or I'm sorry, John 20, 24. Thomas, or Didymus, means a twin. We don't know anything about the other twin of this, of this set, but this is Thomas. So you have Andrew, who's always referred to as the brother of Peter, and you have Thomas, who's referred to as, well, he's the twin. So, kind of an interesting take here. Thomas is most well known for being a doubter. We sing the song, Don't Be a Doubting Thomas, right? Thomas did a lot more than doubt. He was a man who was greatly used of God. He declared in John 20 that he would only believe in Jesus after he had physically touched the scars. And Jesus appeared and said, touch and believe. And his, his doubt was replaced by belief and sight. James, the son of Alphaeus, sometimes referred to as James the Less. And the reason why is because many, just because we know less about him. There's James the Greater, who would be James the brother of John, James the Less, James the son of Alphaeus. Simon, called Zelotes. Little is known about this Simon. You have Simon Peter, and everybody knows Simon Peter. Not a whole lot known about him, other than that he belonged to a partisan faction of the politics of that day, the Zealots. That's what Zelotes means. These were men who were seeking the violent overthrow of Rome and the replacement of Jewish independence. He was, I, I don't know this, but reading between the lines, I'd say that Simon was a little bit of a hothead. 
because that was the group he ran with. Which is interesting, because can you imagine the time shared by Simon the Zealot and Levi the Publican? Suddenly, these two men from radically different worldviews. Levi worked for Rome, and Simon wanted to destroy Rome. And suddenly, they're brought together in this group where Jesus is the head, and these two men who would have hated each other now are joined together in love. You have Judas, the brother of James. This Judas is referred to in Matthew 10, 3 and Mark 3, 8 as Labius, whose surname was Thaddeus, is how he's referred to. So those names, synonymous. So Judas or Thaddeus. We have no specific instances of ministry for this apostle. We don't know anything. Church history would tell you a little bit about all of these men, but we don't have anything biblical on this. And then we have Judas Iscariot. And the only reason that we know anything about him is because of something that hasn't even happened yet. He was the traitor. Judas Iscariot means Judas of Kirion. Iscariot. It sounds, it sounds like a, an insult. It's not. It just means that he was a man of that particular town. Traitor means one who gives into the hands of the enemy. Benedict Arnold is famous for having given West Point over to the British. He's called a traitor, and we have laws against traitors. This man, the name Judas, has gone down as that of a traitor. Treachery. Judas is one of the twelve who we will not see in heaven. John 17, 12 refers to him as the son of perdition. He's not a believer. He followed Christ closely for at least two, two and a half years, and died and went to hell. He had the very best pastor, if you want to use the term loosely, the very best spiritual leadership, and he died and went to hell. Yeah. That says an awful lot, meaning that it, it doesn't matter who you're following. It, it matters what you've done with Jesus Christ, because Judas knew about Christ. Judas would have been one of the men who had a hand in the feeding of the 5,000. He would have carried loaves and fishes to the multitude, and he died without Christ, the one who he followed. So let's wrap it up and let's give some application here. Today, we've seen the importance of prayer, obviously. If Jesus needed it, you need it. Leonard Ravenhill, preacher of yesteryear, said, If we can prayer, we're weak everywhere. It's true. If you can't get it together in prayer, then it speaks of your spiritual health. Jesus took time. And if Jesus, who is God, made time to spend time in fellowship with God, we absolutely must prioritize it in our lives as well. We've also been introduced to the 12 apostles. We're going to see a lot about these men. They were not the religious or the academic elite. As a matter of fact, in the book of Acts, it says, when they saw that they were unlearned men, unlearned and ignorant men, they took note because they had been with Jesus. That's their claim to fame. Not that they were super smart, not that they had this great academic degree, but that they had been with Jesus. Over the weeks and the chapters to come, we're going to see that these men, chosen by God, the, the elite, if you want to use that, the elite because of their position as apostles, we're going to see they struggled with pride. They struggled with prejudice and bigotry, envy, rebellion, doubt, faithlessness, disobedience, and a host of other issues that you and I face too. These were men, and they were just men. When you, If you go into certain cathedrals, you'll see stained glass windows with the, the apostles, and they've got halos. If they were alive today, they'd tell you to get the halo off. Okay? They know they weren't perfect. They weren't, and we'll see that all throughout the, the coming chapters. They were men who failed. Sometimes they failed tragically. But they were men who were used of God. In the book of Luke, we're going to see the training of 11 of these men. Two years of training that enabled them between Acts chapter 2 and Acts 17 to turn the world upside down for the cause of Christ. 11 fishermen and zealots and a tax collector and people who we really just don't know anything about. They turned the world upside down because they had been with Jesus. Jesus. 